Welcome to Education Matters presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Tom Williams. During COVID-19 and the new remote learning environment that North Carolina students are grappling with, our state's business community has stepped up to bridge the digital divide, forming partnerships with local school districts to provide technology and innovative solutions to access school resources. We'll talk with representatives from Google and Innovo today on the show about these partnerships and in another exciting development, we'll introduce the Public School Forum's new president and executive director and future host of Education Matters. Joining us now are Mr. John Bischoff, the executive director of North American commercial category with Lenovo, as well as Ms. Lylan Hester, head of external affairs for Southeast with Google. Thank you both for making the time to be with us today. Thanks for having me. So COVID-19 has really changed the landscape in so many ways for schools, businesses, and the families as we've switched 1.5 million public school students over to remote learning and the big adjustments for their teachers and parents as well. Um, I know that Google and Innovo um, have responded to this in a number of your various partnerships that you all have designed and initiated. Uh, maybe um, starting um, with you first, uh, Lylan, please share the highlights of some of the strategies you've done at Google and how it's worked out. Well, for us, it started maybe four years ago with a pilot in Caldwell County, North Carolina. Um, we have a data center in Caldwell County um, and we have a lot of Googlers who work at that site and like to get dug in into the community. Um, in a conversation with um, the head of the Education Foundation, Pat Triplett, she mentioned that kids have a long bus commute to school. And by long, it's like an hour, one way. And I thought, well, what if we turn that time into um, education time? And she agreed, and we worked with our school partners and um, our city and um, county officials, and they agreed too. And they said, well, I said, well, what if we put Wi-Fi on those school buses? And then at the end of the school day, teachers board their school buses and help kids with their homework. Um, and it worked. Um, we partnered with um, Granite Falls Middle School. That was the middle school that was the first test. Um, and they saw great um, success rates when it came to their end of year test scores. Now, fast forward to COVID-19, those school buses, and at that time it was about uh, 10 school buses, were in the bus yard sitting there. And we thought, well, what if we roll those school buses out and get to the community to where kids are now? So then the concept changed in from rolling study halls into rolling hotspots, where the school buses were retrofitted with um, routers and with antennae so that they could boost the signal. The buses roll out into the community where kids then meet the school bus and are able to access the school system's portal for education, get in there, get their assignment, do their homework. So this project was extended um, into the work that we do with um, NCBCE, which is the North Carolina Business um, Committee on Education. Um, remote learning is something that in the state of North Carolina, there isn't a strong, there isn't a curriculum around. There are resources, but no one ever thought that a pandemic would have to kick everything into high gear where remote learning is going to be essential. So as part of the remote learning um, work group, what we do is that we meet and we make an we create um, resources for the teachers, for the state, in order to get the more than 120,000 kids in the state who don't have access to either the internet devices, that access. John, how about from Lenovo's perspective? Yeah, well, Tom, Lenovo has a long history of being involved with education. Uh, we work with the Cranman Institute, the Boys and Girls Clubs. So when the COVID-19 crisis hit, it, it was really obvious quickly as the work from home, or as doing the school from home, education from home initiatives um, went out, we knew there was many communities that were underserved um, with access to the devices that kids would need to be able to participate um, in that education. So we reached out working with um, the state um, Department of Public Instruction to identify where those communities were and what those needs would be. And we've donated since then um, over, I believe $1.5 million worth of uh, Chromebooks as well as software for, to, to provide these students um, those needed devices. More recently, we found the Carolina Panthers, their player impact committee, um, 
had the same similar idea of recognizing those gaps. And they had a desire to do something similar, donating um, Chromebooks into underserved schools. Um, they reached out to us. We helped them um, reach a quantity to two school systems in particular, Richmond and Columbus, um, donating 600 Chromebooks um, in a partnership with them. So, you know, we recognize that technology needs to be available to everyone. Um, it's something that is absolutely part of our culture. So that was what we worked on to make sure that uh, the kids had that kind of access. So John, let me stay with you uh, for this next uh, question. And that's with your experiences, what do you see as keys to successful partnerships between the business and education sector and the role that each of them play? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say there's two things. First and foremost, you, you gotta be in it for the long term. You, you can't just swoop in, hey, here's a donation and you swoop out. Um, you've gotta be part of the solution of helping the school systems, the teachers know how to integrate that into what they do every day. But the other element of it is, is you've gotta be able to, as a corporation, you gotta provide what they need. So for instance, um, we know that students are probably the hardest audience on their devices of anyone. If you can imagine, I have, th I have three teenagers. I know they beat their devices up more than anyone. So what we provide are, um, you know, rugged eyes. You can drop one of our, our Chromebooks from a height of three or four feet and it'll survive it. If you're just giving a school system something that's gonna break in the first three weeks, you're really not solving their problems. So that's the other piece is give, give the schools and what they need to ensure that it meets it. Very good. Uh, Lylan, anything to add to that in terms of what you see as essential in the business education partnership arena? Being really good listeners to your community partners. Um, you can offer every glitzy, widgety, gadgety thing on the planet, but it's when you sit down and just listen. And I do that in my check-in with folks in different communities throughout the Southeast. I said, if we can be helpful, let us know how. What are your pain points? What's, what do you want us to do at Google to help your students, to help the school district, to help the different states? What do you need? And you throw a question like that out there, people will give you an answer. Then they, and it'll always come from a dream. It's like, well, we've always hoped that one day our school district would go one-to-one. -one. It's like, that's your dream? Let's work to get there. And that's what we've been doing in communities. Right. Well, I know that both of you are active members of the North Carolina Business Committee for Education, and, and we appreciate the impact that they have collectively across the state. So maybe the last, each of you, a final comment of things that you see as emerging trends uh, around how business and education can work together effectively, and maybe any comments about how your employees are engaged. So I'm going to go back to John, and then we'll close out with you, um, Lylan. Thank you. Well, one thing about technology is that it always is changing. So, you know, there are things like, you know, virtual reality, which I believe is going to become a major technology within the next two to three years within schools. So it's going to be very critical that we, that, that we teach the, the school systems, the teachers, the administration, how to integrate and utilize those new technologies. Um, as you talk about our employees, one of the good things about Lenovo is, is they realize that the employees kind of lead the way. They encourage their employees to um, participate in their local schools. They give time off to allow them to do so. We've seen the benefits of when, when our employees as parents or just as, just as people wanting to work with the, the students, when they're engaged, when there's that engagement, there's that listening of how you go out and, and help then that's where the real change occurs. Very good. Lylan, we have about one minute left. I cannot agree more. The, my colleagues, we call ourselves Googlers. When it comes to working in our communities, we get really dug in. Um, and that's everything from speaking um, at different career days to being active in type of job resource. So up in North Carolina, we have a soapbox derby, um, which is called the Gravity Games. And we have 5,000 people attended every year and it's showing kids that STEM isn't just the backpacks and figures in a classroom. It's also building something and making your car go 
fast down a hill at top speed. So it's that excitement that we like to bring to, to the communities. And when it comes to innovation and what we've seen on the horizon, I think a post COVID-19 world is going to be a very different world. There's always been the question around remote work, remote learning, can it work? Are folks just gonna be home doing laundry all day? We've proven that you can be more efficient working from home than at times being in an office. So now that you've made the case, you've proven it, it's what are the extensions around remote learning and remote work going to be in a COVID-19 world. So I think that's the exciting is what the future is gonna hold. And that's a lot of what we're working on. Thank you both so very much for what you're doing, but also thank you for making time to be on Education Matters uh, this evening. We appreciate it. Um, after the break, I'll be interviewing our new president and executive director, Dr. Mary Ann Wool. Thank you so much. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. My pleasure to welcome to Education Matters our new president and executive director of the Public School Forum, Dr. Mary Ann Wolf. Uh, Mary Ann uh, has spent six years prior to joining us with the Friday Institute for Education Innovation. And most recently, she's been the senior director of professional learning and leading collaborative there. And once again, we are delighted to have you with us, Mary Ann. Thank you so much, Tom. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. I have such immense respect uh, for the critical role that the Public School Forum of North Carolina plays in conducting research, developing innovative programs, and creating tangible policy and practice recommendations. Um, thank you so much for providing the opportunity for me to bring my experience in education for many, many years um, to this role. At this time, why the forum? What drew you specifically to this role? Yes, um, well, I believe very much in the potential of a nonpartisan organization to bring people and organizations together to do what is best for our students. The forum has such a rich history of leading in education in North Carolina, and it's particularly important right now at a time when we need to bring together stakeholders across the state to address significant challenges in our schools. I so appreciate their willingness to take on tough issues to make sure we have data and that we can really work together to move the needle for all of our students. Um, the forum for me provided a unique opportunity to bring together my background from my time in DC, from my many, many years now in North Carolina in policy research and advocacy um, with the on the ground work with districts and schools. And so it just felt like a wonderful opportunity and I am thrilled to join such a strong team, board and partners. Great. Well as you referenced a little bit, you're certainly taking the helm at the public school forum at a time when there's significant and collective effort to really ensure uh, significant actions and significant investments moving forward to meet our constitutional obligation to ensure every child a sound basic education as really defined by the longstanding Leandro decision, uh, something that the state has found uh, or the courts have found that our state has really failed to do over the decades. How do you envision uh, a path forward towards Leandro uh, compliance for our state, uh, especially in the context now for COVID-19? And um, what role do you think the forum can play in this? Yes, it's a great question. Um, you know, the past three months have only exacerbated the inequities in our state and the needs of our most vulnerable students. I was very encouraged by the recently released short-term action plan that the parties in Leandro case agreed to and released a couple of weeks ago because it acknowledges the complexities of ensuring that every student has access to a sound basic education. We know that teachers are the most significant school-related factor for student outcomes and school leaders are the second. And Leandro addresses this by emphasizing the importance of creating pipelines and professional learning opportunities for teachers and principals including a focus on a diverse teaching force. The action plan also goes further into addressing the needs of the whole child, providing an opportunity to maximize what we know about learning science and the brain to address trauma-informed practices and learning. I'm encouraged that the plan also includes finance and accountability systems in addition to supporting our low-performing schools. Addressing any one of the primary areas in Leandro may lead to incremental gains for our students. 
but recognizing the importance of systemic change by thinking about statewide structures and human capacity needs while also providing opportunities to support students' academic and social emotional learning really does have the opportunity to create a path for all students in North Carolina to have access to a sound basic education. It's um, exciting also that under your uh, leadership, uh, the Public School Forum will be launching a new center on, uh, with a focus on racial equity called the Dudley Flood Center for Educational Equity and Opportunity. Uh, it will serve as a critical resource during a time when our country is pushing back against a legacy of systemic racism uh, and other inequities and social injustices, and that we as an organization are actively engaged in efforts to eliminate systemic racism uh, in the educational system and our schools. Can you talk some about the effort and uh, the opportunities that you see it presents? Yes, Tom, I am so grateful for the foresight of the board and the early supporters of the Flood Center. In recent weeks, we have brought together an ad hoc committee to provide recommendations to the board on the eight key areas of focus that were identified by our study group 16. And the discussions and timing are particularly poignant. I feel so fortunate that Dr. Flood is part of this work and his experience and work in North Carolina provide an ideal, but also a challenge for all of us as we work to build a center that unearths and addresses the true challenges we face while providing resources, support, and recommendations to all of those working towards policy and practical strategies. I think it's important to remember that equity does not mean equal inputs for all, but rather it's understanding the needs of each student and striving to meet those needs so that each student can reach their full potential. And when I think about Leandro and I think about the deep work of the forum, the center is exactly the right place to bring those together with many, many partners and stakeholders from across the state. Um, the Flood Center is not intended to be a, simply be a place where people can talk about the issues, but instead an opportunity to make sure that people can come together to have the hard conversations that lead to solutions and actions to address the inequities that so many of our students especially our low income students and students of color face. So as we look ahead, I think the Flood Center will play a critical role in education in North Carolina, but also helping all of us to make sure we're focusing on the deep issues that equity and racial equity bring to our world and our state and our schools. We're looking forward to that work moving forward and uh, your role in helping to lead that initiative. Uh, the forum offers, as you know, several innovative and existing programs that are doing important work uh, to meet students' needs, like our Resilience and Learning Project, as well as the North Carolina Center for After School Programs. Tell us about these initiatives and generally speaking, your goals for how the forum supports uh, and lifts up public education across our great state of North Carolina. I think now more than ever, we've seen the importance of public education, but also going deeply looking at schools, how much schools um, really are the hubs of our community. And as we move forward, we know that that is critical that we continue to make sure that our public schools are strong and are able to meet the needs of our students. Right now, I feel like the forum is uniquely positioned to bring its expertise in policy and research, as well as its on the ground programs. We are in schools every day when we are face to face, but working with schools every day now virtually. Um, and we will bring all of that to the challenges we face. We recognize that we cannot do this alone and we don't wanna do this alone. So in the next month, we will convene key nonprofit groups and stakeholders across the state with the goal of addressing policy challenges that we all see facing our schools. We appreciate that working together will allow us to make strides that none of us can do working alone. While the events that we will host will certainly be different this year and some will be delayed, we will continue our partnership event, The Color of Education. We'll do this virtually this fall to ensure that we can provide opportunities for those engaged in education in North Carolina to come together to learn, to push each other, and to continue equity. We will also build our work with schools and districts. You mentioned, Tom, the Resilience and Learning in the Center for After School Programs. We are hosting opportunities for educators this summer um, with our Synergy Conference for our after school programs but also for our resilience and learning for the many schools that have participated with us over the years. 
Our resilience and learning program works closely with teams in schools, so very much on the ground in coaching as we think about adverse childhood experiences and making sure that teachers are able to provide a culture and strategies that are needed to support those students. We also know that our after school programs really help to think about how we can expand and extend learning opportunities for our students. And once again, our current crisis has brought to light how important that is for our students. As we look ahead, we believe we'll bring these bodies of work in policy and practice more closely aligned with our deep work on equity to support the important policy discussions and actions needed, as well as support schools and districts in their work to address the whole child. The forum's mission is to provide trusted, nonpartisan, evidence-based research, policy analysis, and innovative programs that empower an informed public to demand that education best practices become common practice throughout North Carolina. As a team and a board and with our partners, we are challenged by the opportunity and the responsibility to work toward this in the coming weeks, months, and years. And I am very grateful to be able to join the forum now in my third week and to work towards these tremendous challenges for our state, but are so important for each and every one of our students. Well, thank you, Mary Ann, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to be teamed up with you the past three weeks and look forward to, to seeing you again soon here on Education Matters, as well as uh, other, uh, other work sessions. Thank you again. We're all familiar with the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. During these incredibly challenging and unsettling times caused by COVID-19, this sage advice serves as a guidepost in helping ensure each child in North Carolina has a positive experience in re-entering their formal learning at the start of the 2021 school year. Whether one serves in an elected leadership position at the state or local level, or as a business leader or community volunteer, the unique learning needs of our students and the needed support of their families across our state are as great today as any other time in our recent history. Whether our schools ultimately reopen in August as full-time face-to-face, hybrid face-to-face and remote learning, or a totally remote learning scenario, the impact of COVID-19 for each of these plans will require significant adjustments and resources to work. Without a doubt, as our state experienced in the last three months of this most recent school year, additional financial, human, and technical resources are essential in making certain every child has the opportunity to receive a sound basic education as guaranteed by the North Carolina Constitution. Governor Cooper, our General Assembly, State Board of Education, Department of Public Instruction, and other state and local agencies have taken critical and timely action in allocating available federal and state funds to address such critical needs as student food insecurity, the inequities of access and availability to broadband, and technology resources for remote learning for our most disadvantaged communities and students. The Leandro Action Plan, as presented by the state defendants to Judge David Lee on June 15, 2020, and the additional $427 million it requires as a first step, presents our legislative leaders with the opportunity to advance our response to COVID-19 and for our state's K-12 public schools to emerge from this pandemic better positioned to meet the expectations for improved student achievement and school performance. Business and community leaders are to be commended for their efforts to provide the much needed additional support, volunteers and resources in our local schools and communities. Their continued conversations with local superintendents, principals, teachers, education foundations and related nonprofits throughout these summer months will go a long way in meeting the needs of our students as they re-enter school in August. Our students are counting on all of us to do our part. Let's show them we're up to the challenge now and for years to come. That's it for this week's show. See you next week.